Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, webinar. My name is Thomas Bayer, and I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Talamore Hospital, which is based in Ireland. And today I would like to share my experience with bioabsorbable magnesium screws. The implant is called Magnesex from uh, the company is called Syntelex based in Hanover, Germany. My talk will take about 40 minutes and you will have the chance to ask uh, questions in between in the box and I will be able to answer a couple of questions at the end of this talk. So let's start the presentation. So as I said, Talamore is based in Ireland and I'm the present secretary of the Irish Foot and Ankle Society. So I'm doing both trauma and foot and ankle elective surgery. My disclosure, I've uh, received financial support of this presentation, but otherwise I have no disclosure. Now, what are we talking about today? There are different types of screws based of 90, more than 90% made of magnesium. On the, the top corner, you see the typical Herbert screw, and uh, they're cannulated screws and uh, in different sizes. The two millimeter screws is not cannulated, the other, the other ones are. And then on the lower end, you see cortical screws in different sizes. Um, and they are the screws I have experience with. Just for completion, there are other types of screws. They developed pins, and a device to do uh, PIP J toe fusion and I have no experience with those implants I just haven't used them yet. Now my experience I started to use the implants back in November 2016 and I would have used uh, 211 screws by now in 105 uh, patients mostly in elective foot and ankle cases but as I had the screws available on the shelf, I started to do more and more trauma cases uh, with it. You have to ask the question if the titanium, the steel screws, they work well, why should you change if something is working? Because I normally spend a lot of time in removing metal because of the potential stress shielding if you have a sturdy implant we all know that you have a bone degradation beside it so bone needs load uh, to keep his bone density and that's the reason why I normally tend to take the metal out and um, so that was the first need for a bioabsorbable implant. Secondly it's convenient it's very handy in cases where you normally would have to take the metal out anyway let's say in a pediatric population where you are almost obliged to remove the metal in growing bone. And then there are further advantages, let's say in once the implant is in, it causes only minimal artifacts in CTs and MRI. And um, there are a couple of cases where you might have to go back in the future again and you wouldn't have any interference with metal placed in before. And lastly, there's, there's a very high patient acceptance. So I'm using the screw since uh, November 2018. And for example, for elective hallux valgus deformities, I would give people normally the option and say, listen, I have uh, the option of fixing, let's say, the scarf osteotomy with titanium screws or bioabsorbable screws then from my experience, most of the patients would choose the screw which dissolves. And uh, so it gives you this special extra boost for your practice as well. And that's why I was kind of keen to use this product. And, I, I, and as I said, I started using them. I have uh, about uh, three or four years experience now. If you look at the biodegradation Weizzi et al. back in 2014 uh, looked at um, what happens with the screw in a rabbit model. So they put in the screw and then they did cross sections of it. Uh, and you see in those histology pictures on the left hand side, you see the screws after a couple of days made of magnesium. And then a couple of months later, it starts, the degradation process starts. 
and um, and then at the end at 12 months you see where the screw has been it almost has filled up with calcium phosphate and on the magnification on the right hand side you see integration of bone so it is somehow that the screw then over time turns into normal bone what happens with the screw it dissolves so you would have magnesium hydroxide as a um, corrosion product and small amounts of hydrogen gas. The magnesium screw in total is, is made nearly more than 90% of magnesium. The grain size is uh, less than 10 micrometer and it's manufactured using a so-called powder metallurgical process. The idea is not new. They have used uh, wires and pins back in the 1890s and the main problem in pure magnesium implants is that it dissolved too early and there was a considerable amount of gas formation, hydrogen gas formation with uh, this magnesium alloy that's well controlled. It still has a small amount of hydrogen gas, but uh, the process of the screw dissolving has been delayed so that you can guarantee a bone consolidation before the screw dissolves. Now the characteristics, again, degradation via corrosion. As it dissolves, it creates an alkaline uh, setting, so about 9.5. The box don't like it, so potentially it's infection inhibiting. Um, it's osteoconductive, as we saw from the histology there done in rabbits. The absorption time takes about a year, a year and a half, but Sometimes, so the process of degradation, you would see signs of it already after two to three months, still with the screw being stable enough to guarantee a bony consolidation. And this active bone transformation is the only issue with the screw because you need to teach your stuff, radiology and so on. It appears temporarily and it looks like, um, well, let's call it a transformation zone. And I'll show you a couple of facts very uh, soon. In terms of the, uh, if you look at the Young's module, in terms of the tensile compression strength and uh, the elasticity, it's, uh, it has the same char characteristics as cortical bone. And um, so it's, it's strong enough initially. Now that's the transformation zone I was talking about. It's a study done in 2018 looking at the fixation of medial malleolus fractures with two magnesium screws. They had uh, good clinical results and no implant failure. But you see already after one, two, three months, you see this, this fringe around the screw, which could easily, if you don't teach people easily be mixed up with an abscess or osteolysis. But if you look at the x-ray at six months, this has completely dissolved and you see a good bony consolidation. So what, what it is exactly, we don't know yet, but it does not cause any problems. And I show you my clinical results in, in a few minutes. So, as I was talking about the corrosion product, it might be a, a mix of hydrogen, magnesium hydroxide and small amounts of hydrogen gas. And the osteoconductive characteristic of this screw might be with an increase of the volume that it will induce bone growth into that fringe. But how it exactly happened, we don't know yet. So, so the, those are the issues with the screw. So you have this temporarily transformation zone after two to three months, which fully disappears after six months. So you need to do teaching. You need to make the patient aware of those findings on the x-ray and you need to teach the radiology department, otherwise you will get reports back and saying you have loosening of the screw or an abscess formation, which is not the case because um, the clinical signs of infection and swelling are not present. 
So as I said, 211 screws used in 105 patients. I had one implant failure and that was I used uh, 2.7 millimeter cannulated screws for a medial malleolus fracture and I normally tend to mobilize all my ankle fractures post-operatively in an air cast boot and the weight bears tolerated and the combination of this early mobilization which I, I want the patient to do with um, uh, a downsized uh, screw led to the implant. That wasn't a big issue, I just changed uh, the screw to a bigger size. If that happens, you easily can overdrill the implant. At three months, I, um, I, I realized it is kind of mildly displaced. So I reduced it again and uh, put a bigger size screw in. I had one deep wound infection and that was in a patella, comminuted patella fracture, which I reconstructed, but I augmented the patella with um, a polyethylene tape in a figure of eight. And um, I, she required a washout and debridement of the wound and going in the area of the patella itself hasn't been affected, so I, I didn't go near it. So the distal pole of the wound where the knot of uh, the polyethylene tape was made responsible for the infection. And I had two wound instances after hallux valgus um, correction, which would kind of correlate to my normal complication rate, even with a titanium screw and pe people mobilizing early, not keeping the foot uh, elevated every now and then within the first two or three weeks after hallux valgus uh, correction. So now that we went through the characteristics of uh, the implant, let's, let me present you a couple of cases. So this is how I started using the magnesium screw. You see on the pre-operative x-ray this exaggerated severe hallux valgus deformity with almost uh, luxation of the first MTPJ. On the lateral view you see um, the complete elevation of the first uh, ray. So what I did initially, because I, do, I didn't know how the implant, how strong it is, how, how it behaves, so I used it in combination with another implant with a low profile a locking plate and I used the magnesium screw as a compression. I don't know if you can see it there, but uh, literally the screw is, goes from there to there. So that's the magnesium screw. So I put it in first as a compression for the compression of the joint and then I neutralized the joint with a locking plate. So um, they all did well, so I had no implant failure eventually because, well, the plate was securing, but from a, from a pure wound point of view, they were healing well. So I started using them without any implants. That's a moderate hallux valgus deformity. As I said, I'm specialized in foot and ankle, and, um, and the magnesium screws are ideal, especially for hallux valgus um, corrections. And again, for those, uh, for those fixations, I used uh, the headless uh, Herbert screw, which is kind of the same design as a bolt screw then. And uh, they are cannulated, so you can do your scarf osteotomy, you position your K-wires, and then you drill it, and then you over-drill the head and put the screw in. Now, there are a couple of, of tips as the, 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 the screwdriver itself is made of steel and the screw is from magnesium. You just, with the handling, you have to be a little bit more precise so it's not as forgiving with the steel. But um, if, if you have an accurate drilling and you over drill the head, you, you shouldn't have any, any issues with it. And that's the post-operative x-ray. So you see the x-ray after six months, so almost uh, this fringe has dissolved and a good correction and uh, the patient is happy and uh, the seam, so there's a very high acceptance in using absorbable screws for this type of surgery. I had a lady two years ago and she had headless titanium screws and where you just basically know as a surgeon this can't cause any trouble but she was insisting of me removing the screw and I did it as a day case. So in those cases if people have a notion that there's still some, some issues or the metal might interfere, um, you just say it will dissolve, there's no need to take them out. 
Now that's another Halux valgus correction. Again, you see a moderate Halux valgus uh, deformity. And then again, uh, fixed with a scarf osteotomy and a modified McBride procedure. Potentially, if, you're, if they need an Aiken, you could do an Aiken and fix them with a magnesium screw as well, if, um, if, if you need to. And this is an X-ray of the three months. You see kind of a small amount there uh, of the described transformation zone on the distal screw. But, um, but clinically, you wouldn't see any, any, any increased swelling post-operative compared to with the titanium screws. Now, my colleagues in Hanover, uh, Christian Plas and Professor Wintagen, they looked at the results and they compared the titanium screws with, with uh, the magnesium screws. So they already have uh, three years results as they started already in 2013-14 to use the screws. So they have uh, three year results already. And they had 26 patients in each group, all doing well, comparable clinical results. But what they found is on the magnesium screws, they're favorable in post-op radiological assessment. And that's what I was saying before, they're just minimal artifacts in CT and MRI. So you keep the foot or ankle or wherever you put the implants in scannable. Now, as I had the screws on the shelf, I thought uh, this is ideal for a pediatric population as we're covering the trauma as well. Um, I started to use them in three plane fractures. At the time now, this was the first case I did. I didn't have the CBS screws or the magnesium, the cortical screws on the shelf, but I had the cannulated screws. So unfortunately I had to combine the implants, but it's still, I still used it in the epiphysis. And on this X-ray, you see how it works. You put uh, a K-wire in, you just uh, check the location on the X-ray and then uh, you, you over drill the head size there and, um, and then you put the screw in and as you can see you get a good I'm happy with the compression it, um, it, uh, it produces and you see anatomical reduction there and patient was doing really well afterwards still had to come back after three months to remove the other screws but now since I am using the cortical screws as well they're fully uh, I, I use bioabsorbable screws uh, only, so they don't need to come back for removal. That was in, initially in the year 2017 when I did not have any uh, the, the full variety and sizes of the implants. Another perfect case, the lower fractures we all know they uh, happen at a young age and you see a cross section there of the axial CT and um, this is not an area where you necessarily want to go back but if you put the cortical screws you need to remove them as they're still growing so in this case i used the magnesium screw as well and that's the post-operative x-ray you barely see the screw so it's just one of my scrub nurses called it the ghost screw for that reason because even when you put it in intraoperative screening you don't see it and that's why here in the hospital we call it let's get a ghost screw so that's how we call them you put, you put them in, it's nicely reduced and uh, they heal well and especially in kids they don't need to go through a second procedure with all the risks. Now we looked at our results, so this is fresh from the press, so I asked my resident to submit it to the injury and he submitted it last weekend. So that's a magnesium based compression screws in three plane anchor fractures, I would have done five by now. The mean age 12.8 years, follow up at 3, 6 and 12 months, all with satisfactory anatomical reduction and bony consolidation. They all made a full recovery and there have no, been no wound complications. So this is encouraging. So every pediatric three-plane fracture, of course, I'm using the magnesium screw now. Another case here, unusual case, an avulsion fracture of the distal fibula with, uh, with insufficiency of, of uh, the ankle. Um, he was in constant pain, conservative management failed. So after six months I went in, I wasn't sure about whether to excise or reattach that fragment. And uh, so that's it confirmed in the, the MRI with a bit of fluid around it. And um, so I went in and debrided the fragment and got a, um, a bone anchor as well to reattach the, the, the lateral complex. 
and uh, he bonded up and he's doing well and there haven't been any issues. Another case here that's again a mix of different implants so the patient um, might need if there are any issues a removal of metal especially in this trimalleolar ankle fracture there's a there's some risk of them developing an ankle osteoarthritis so you might be forced to come back in and if if they like you and and they're happy with your result they might come back to you and then if you need to do an ankle replacement or an ankle fusion because they're, they're grossly arthritic you spend the first half an hour removing all the plate and you have bony overgrowth so sometimes i tend to on the complex cases just to remove the metal after within a year or so because it's it makes your life easier in this particular case i'm showing you this case because uh, she had a small avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus you probably haven't seen it but if you look at the ap uh, image you can see this 3.2 cannulated screw going across with a nice anatomical reconstruction of the articular surface as the fragment was so small if you would use a conventional screw of the so, so the fragment was the the diameter of the screw so there's no way you could fix it unless you're using a very small screw now on this one when the screw dissolves and um, there's bony ingrowth so you're happy enough then for this the 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 defect to fill up uh, so that's why I used the implant and I, again she did uh, well and that's the actually after three months um, that's another case um, where with with a type 3 navicular fracture on the axial view here on the CT you see almost compression of the navicular bone with almost uh, destruction so I wanted to restore the medial column so what, what I did, I was planning to put a bridging plate in, but uh, on the same time as, again, I had the magnesium screws available here in the hospital, I started using different cannulated screw and I reconstructed the navicular and, uh, and then put a bridging plate in, which I removed after three months. So in this case, still, I had to bring the patient back to remove the bridging plate. But um, if you put headless titanium screws in the bone, there's you cause more destruction in getting them out again and I wanted to fix it somehow so I was able to reconstruct the fragments with different sizes screws a combination of 2.7 and 3.2 cannulated screws you see kind of a reasonable of course there's consolidate this this sclerotic bone and uh, and it was fairly stiff after the removal with kind of moderate stiffness of the tail and navicular joint but after the removal you see kind of a Kind of a reasonable reshaped navicular bone given the type the type of injury beforehand and um, so i i've done this two years ago and i haven't seen this patient back with any issues yet thankfully this is another case a construction worker who fell off a roof you see the considerable damage done through the tailor body so literally the whole posterior medial talus is missing he was primarily fixed uh, in another hospital they put an x fix on they couldn't reduce him so they opened it they um, they put the chunk of bone in the bin so it wasn't available to me and then they transferred him to me i removed the x fix i did a medial malleal osteotomy and i reshaped the missing bone i filled up with ilia crest bone and that's uh, intraoperative uh, x-rays where you just provisionally held the bone graft uh, with uh, K-wise and then I reconstructed and I integrated my three cortical iliac bone graft into, into the missing piece in the posteromedial aspect of the talus. And it was uh, solid after removal of K-wise. And you see post-operative x-ray with nicely reconstructed articular surface and the lateral view as well and it's hard to say but I, uh, it's hard to see but I put about five magnesium screws in you see it there on the axle wood there's one there one here one there and of course with the damage done and there's no cartilage on the top you would expect him to have issues in the past and I've, I've in, in the future and I've seen him only two or three months ago and of course he's terribly stiff 
and he has some issues with the ankle, but for the moment he's, he's, he's dealing well and he doesn't want further surgery. But then, again, at the time I didn't have uh, the 3.5 uh, cortical screws made of magnesium and that's why I used uh, the, 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 the stainless steel screws. If this guy would come in today, I would certainly use magnesium screws for um, the fixation of my medial malleolus osteotomy as well. Um, because in this case, um, if, if there are any issues, I, I got him back three months ago because he, he was stiff and, and he has some soreness in, in the ankle as you would expect after this uh, type of injury. So I got him back as a day case, but I had to remove the screws. So if, if you look at the next case, again with a comminuted uh, patella fracture, um, I CT her and it was six fragments. It looks like it's three there, but it's always CT, lo lo always looks worse than it is. And when I went in, that was confirmed. It was the, the patella was all in pieces. And um, I reconstructed it with different magnesium screws. And that's again an area where you don't necessarily want any metal in because if she would have trouble in the future, you almost fill up all the gaps with hardware. So I used the magnesium screws with, with this and I augmented it with uh, polyethylene tape in a figure of eight. I drilled a canal through the tibial tuberosity just to take the, the, the pull down to take the tension off the patella. And that's the, the only case I had a deep wound infection, but I had to open the distal um, wound and it was going through the knot of the polyethylene and she required the Brightman and two washouts. And, um, and that's, um, and that's uh, basically the polyethylene tape has to be blamed for it. But on the other hand, it has been a fairly comminuted fracture with quite a soft tissue swelling. So it wouldn't be unusual to develop uh, wound problems, but in her specific case, it was going down all the way down to the knot. You, you can imagine it's like a polyethylene tape and then you, you, you tighten it and you put the knot in which is pro prominent and that probably got infected that was causing the issues. As I went in, um, the patella was well, well healed. I didn't have to go all the way up so I didn't open the wound. Uh, so I don't, I haven't seen the patella itself so I don't know how the screws behave but you see on the post-operative x-ray this is after six months and, and uh, once the wound was healed and the infection was dealt with she was mobilizing. Small defect there but that wouldn't bother her. The articular surface is, is well reconstructed and she's, uh, she's happy now and she's able to flex her knee now after extensive physiotherapy up to 100 degrees. This is another case where you just uh, have uh, an olecanon fracture. And that's a case again where the metal was annoying me with the conventional tension band wires. It, it somehow, it's very superficial in this area and it always, like almost 50% of the cases I had to remove the tension band wire and the K wires in the classical AO technique. And that uh, somehow annoyed me. Um, so I looked at different options and I started using the magnesium screws uh, for those type of injuries again um, as well. And um, I used three 3.5 cortical screws for compression instead of the K wires. And then instead of um, uh, a wire, I use a tension bent wire polyethylene tape again with a hole drilled through the olecranon in a figure of eight to, as a tension band. So, this is the post-operative x-ray and you see good anatomical fixation and, um, and that's the x-ray of three months. So again you see kind of this small area, this is my drilled hole for the figure of eight tape. But then you see this area which a radiology could misinterpret as osteolysis or an abscess. It's, I can guarantee you it's, um, it's a temporary x-rays and we looked at our results and, and this transformation zone disappeared after six months if you would get an x-ray after six months. And, um, 
and they all did uh, well. We published those cases as well. I'll show you the results in a minute. This is another case uh, we did uh, three weeks ago, and it's a, a little bit more comminuted fracture. So I used 3.5 screws in this case, two 3.5 screws for compression, but there were two fragments there. So I used the two millimeter screws to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the, um, the articular surface. And again, a polyethylene tape as a tension band to allow early rehabilitation so nobody goes into a cast. They start early range of motion exercises and, uh, and the construct and the screws and the tape in combination are stable enough. So these are our cases. We did six cases between December 2017 and November 2018. All, as I said, uh, nobody's um, in a cast. They all get the dressing postoperatively and start early range of motion uh, exercises and they're all linked with physiotherapy. And all the patients had um, um, very good results with uh, MEP scores of 94 and a mean DASH score of 4.5. No wound complication and all gained a bony consolidation. Now, in, as, a, as a summary, with the bioabsorbable magnesium screws, we have an implant which is biodegradable with good to excellent uh, results from my experience since uh, November 2016. It's ideal for a patient specialized in foot and ankle surgery, but I know of colleagues doing scaphoid fixations of it. They're very happy with the results as well. It is basically made for intra-articular fractures where you don't, especially in areas where you don't necessarily want to go back. For example, the case I showed you with the Taylor body reconstruction with the medial mal uh, osteotomy, you just, it certainly the removal of metal wouldn't be easy as a day case. Patient would need to be hospitalized. Uh, so for any type of headless screws where you need to reconstruct the anticular surface or if you have a, a bigger size osteochondral lesions in the joint, you could use headless screws or you could use the pins available. Um, it has a very high patient uh, satisfaction. So patients, as I said, look almost surprised that a bioabsorbable screw does exist. And certainly I give them the option between a magnesium screw and a titanium screw. And uh, I would say the vast majority would pick the bioabsorbable magnesium screw for the fixation. I haven't seen any adverse reactions of the implant. The deep infection I had was uh, definitely related to the polyethylene tape. And um, um, it's, there are no allergic reactions described for the implant because it's um, like we all have magnesium in our body anyway. And, um, and um, the handy thing is if you, you don't need to remove the hardware so as it dissolves and you would have um, a, a transformation zone which I extensively describe now because that's the only issue of the implant you need, as with any innovative program, you need to rethink and you need to learn to interpret your x-rays. So you need to involve your NCHDs, your residents, the nurses, the patient, and the radiology department. And it's considerably strong implant um, comparable with cortical bone and it will uh, give you enough uh, stability until it uh, dissolves to achieve uh, bony consolidation but you need to check your indication as I said the implant failure I had I had a two-week implant which was a cannulated first of all a cannulated screw and, uh, and the size wasn't right in combination with letting the patient mobilizing, which I, which I need uh, to do for um, postoperatively. In this ankle fracture, I, uh, I had one implant failure where the, the screw was too weak 
and uh, it failed and it wasn't a big deal to change it afterwards. So it's, I'm pretty much done with my talk now. So we have a little bit more time now for questions. As, um, so we have 10 to 15 minutes left. So as I said, if you're in the box below, don't hesitate to ask me any questions. And, um, and I would try to, to address them all. Thanks very much, first of all, for listening. And um, so we can, we can swap to the questions then. I have the first question coming in. And somebody is asking, is it uh, possible to remove the screw? Well, potentially the screw is, is dissolvable, so, so ideally you shouldn't have to remove them. If there's a problem, if, if, if you're in an early stage, uh, you certainly would be able to just, as in a normal screw, just to take it out. But from as the, the screwdriver is made of steel and the magnesium screw is potentially softer than it, uh, of it, you need, you could, if the screw is in the way after three months, easily over drill the screw. So that's not an issue. But Within the first three months, you certainly would be able, just with a screwdriver, to take it off. If it would happen that the screw head would be damaged, then, um, then you could just easily, with a bigger size, just over drill it and replace it with an implant or whatever you have to do. So, but ideally, you shouldn't have to remove them. That's the whole purpose of using bioabsorbable screws. And I, I, I didn't have to remove any screws so far. So it's the, the one with the implant failure, I over drilled it and got a bigger size screw, which was literally a magnesium screw as, as well. And the patient healed and, and did well. So let's get another question there. Um, how long does it take for the screw to dissolve? Well, it takes a year, a year and a half to dissolve and you will have less and less artifacts in MRI and CTs. It's um, the process of degradation with magnesium hydroxide and small amounts of gas formation. This phenomenon you will see after two to three months already. And that's the X-ray, this, the so-called transformation zone you have seen, which I extensively Describe before and because I think that's important just to include the whole team because um, because otherwise uh, there they, they might be so so Your colleagues might cause trouble by misinterpreting x-rays for example the radiology They couldn't know but if you tell them you do the teaching in your hospital it's, it's easy enough just to explain it and um, and um, and I have all the x-ray after six months where this transformation zone is, is gone and uh, there is full bony consolidation. So we have uh, another question there. So in your, somebody is asking, in your opinion, what is the biggest drawback of the magnesium products and how would you fix it? The biggest drawback is again going back at this transformation zone because as I started using it I had um, a couple of reports saying oh this is this is there's a query of abscess formation in the joint so at the time I had no experience with the implant so you're, you're kind of a little bit worried and as I was showing you in the first case, I, I wasn't sure on how strong the implant is, so I combined the implants to see how does the um, degradation act with uh, the soft tissue as well, would, would, uh, how does the wound behave, would the wound heal, because I knew well that it, 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 I knew well beforehand of this transformation zone. So looking at the x-ray, I was worrying 
would that be stable enough? So if the de degradation starts already after two to three months, is the implant really strong enough for the time to achieve bony consolidation? And that's why initially I just, especially on the fusions, I, um, I used it in first MTPJ fusions as a compression screw. And as I had no issues, I kind of started to extend my indications for the magnesium screws. And you need to check your indication. You need a strong enough implant, so that takes a little bit of experience. But normally, it's what you would use in, uh, for example, a medium malleolo screw, where you use a 3.5 screw, you can use easily use a 3.5 fully threaded magnesium screws for the fixation of the magnesium uh, for the medium malleolus. And as I said, I let them walk on it after bimalleolar ankle fractures. I let them wait there from day one in an aircast boot and, um, and I haven't had any implant failures with the fully threaded, not cannulated 3.5 magnesium screws. So, so it's easy, so they're safe enough to, to use for, for the fixation. And um, that's, that's, I think that's the only drawback of it. So, um, so the transformation zone and um, and um, and to involve the whole hospital. Now, um, you could say the screw, there's another question here, you could say the screw would mostly resolve after three months, meaning that the screw would bear the load for at least three months, correct? That's correct, so I would definitely say the screw is stable for at least uh, three months, but the process of, of degradation starts. Uh, when I, um, in, in the case of the implant failure, when I, um, when I um, over drilled it, it was kind of still a, a solid enough implant, but um, I didn't over drill it in the same direction as the original screw, so I used a slightly different position. But, uh, but then with, you, you can easily then drill it through with a bit of effort, whereas with through um, a steel screw, you wouldn't be able just to drill through it. But I, uh, I almost, as I only have this one implant failure, I almost can guarantee a strong enough uh, fixation for the first at least three months until to achieve bony consolidation. Um, so, and in, in that case after three months, there was still, still a good magnesium material left in situ. So according to the company itself, it takes kind of to fully dissolve, it takes a year, a year and a half. And I would say between it, it, it starts after the process of degradation starts after two to three months and then, and then the implant gets weaker and weaker and then it dissolves and then by a year, year and a half, it's, it's nearly fully gone. You see it on x-ray somehow, it's like uh, when you remove the, the, the screw in stainless steel, you, the, you, you drill canal, you see kind of a little bit the screw, but the screw is, is as the histology cuts in in, in the rabbit model was showing it fills up with calcium phosphate and that's, that's the screw size uh, you see at the end. Um, so somebody else is asking, do you always perform the over drilling of the screw head or you sometimes just screw the implant in? That's a very good question. What uh, in my first MPT, uh, MTPJ fusions, where I drill the canal, I don't need to over drill the head because I use them um, basically on the, on the, I put a screw in from medially and as I do the, the uh, eminectomy, the bunionectomy itself, um, I have a soft enough bone in that area where you just with, with a little bit of a, of a push and screwing in, it's, it's, it's far better not to over drill it. But if you do a scarf osteotomy where you would have good solid cortical bone, there's no way you get the screw in without over drilling the head. So in the, in the, so in the cannulated CS screws, you need to over drill the head. They, they, they are the ones in the design of a Herbert screw. You need to over drill the head size. 
So it's a, you put your cannulated screw in and then there's a specific reamer for the head you put in through your cannulated uh, guide wire. And on, on, on the scarf osteotomy, you definitely need to over drill it. There are cases where the bone is soft enough and you just can, can, can advance it without over drilling it. On the so-called CBS screws, which they call the cortical screws, the fully threaded it, you just use it like a, like a, a normal AO screw. You pre-drill it and you put it in. In those ones, you don't need to over, over drill any head. Uh, you, just, you just drill a hole and put the screw in. So it's, uh, we're talking about those Herbert design screws uh, you saw earlier then on the top and uh, bottom pre, um, part of the presentation. Um, do you have any other questions? Long I answered that one. Uh, your pen will be stronger. It's um, it's basically. I think we answered all 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 the questions. Unless somebody somebody wants wants to ask. Let's see the time. It's pretty much forty five minutes. So, as, so just as a summary, using them since November 2016, you see I, I had a very cautious approach. So I initially kind of started them and combining them with other implants. But um, as a summary is, I'm, it's an implant I'm very happy about as I was very aggressive in removing metal in patients anyway, because of the, the, the different reasons I, I mentioned before. And, um, and it seems to be strong enough, or from my experience, it's strong enough to, to achieve bony consolidation, and, uh, but then it uh, dissolves on, on time. So you see on the vari variety of cases, once, once you have it available, on, on the shelf, it's, it's kind of, you kind of will, will have different cases where you just see a big enough osteocondylation and then the, 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 the implant is available and in trauma cases where you can't, you, you, you can't really plan it or, or order the implant beforehand, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's handy to have it as an option. Um, now, there's, there's another question coming in. Now, what product would you wish for next to further enhance the lineup? It's, well, ideally, I would fix the whole, let's say, in this trimalleolar or ankle fractures, uh, ideally, in, in the future, we, we would have implants which will fully dissolve, and that would include uh, plates and, and screws. Because you saw a couple of cases there, of course, I, I don't, on the trimalleolar ankle fracture, I, as I said, I normally, as a day case, within a year, in those complex cases, even the patient did ha have no pain and no issues, um, I removed all the metal because within a year or two, let, let's do it, let's say two years, it's easy enough, they come back as a day case, I go through the same incision, I remove all the implants once I know everything is, is, is well healed. And if there's still no, no bioabsorbable magnesium plates available on the market, but that would be certainly a product I would look into it because then I don't have to book patients in. We're all busy enough and if they, they take quite a bit of time and uh, I would have like two removal of metals in every elective list every week and uh, it would free my time a bit to do other cases because um, we have a busy enough waiting list and uh, that would make my life easier and it would make, of course, the patient's life easier because he, he doesn't have to go through um, another procedure with all their risks. And, uh, but as I said, in, in the trimalleolar ankle fractures, if, if there's a potential issues for the future, I, I tend to take the metal out because if there are issues in 10 years' time, 
I don't need to spend half an hour to remove the metal. And we all know if you take the metal out of the 10 years, you have a bony overgrowth and then it's a more extensive procedure. You need osteotomes and chisel to take the bony overgrowth off the plate. The head might be damaged by the time, so you need a, um, um, a broken screw removal set and it makes life uh, very, very difficult for yourself and the patient as well because it takes longer for the patient to procedure and, uh, and with a higher complication rate. And if you're starting using osteotomes because there's bony overgrowth, you have a bit more bleeding from the bone which you can't really control then. Um, so, um, so I tend, I'm, 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 I'm a big advocate in removing metal anyway. And, uh, and that's why when, when I heard about this implant, I, I, I definitely kind of was the right person to be approached to. So um, they, they didn't have to convince me too much kind of to start the process of gaining ex experience with it. All right, so if there are no further questions, I uh, thank you very much for listening and joining this uh, webinar. And, um, and uh, thanks for listening.